Good afternoon and welcome to another edition of APP's Big Family Meeting. I am very excited to uh, have this meeting with you all today uh, with a good friend of mine, uh, Matt Meehan, who is uh, the Director of Academic Programs at Hillsdale College. He's also a professor for the new grad programs up there. Um, we're going to be talking about Matt's new book, Just Dropped, The Handsome Little Signet. It is one of the best uh, children's books I've ever come across, and that's not an exaggeration, and I have five children, so uh, I know what I'm talking about, <laughs> and I have a very low reading level, so uh, uh, I'm, it's my favorite type of literature. Um, so uh, we are going to talk about children's literature, children's entertainment, all the different forms of uh, media that is going into your child's brain and affecting them and shaping them into the people that they are. Um, I was so impressed with Matt's book. I demanded that he come on and join us and talk with you all today. Um, so we're very lucky. Matt, thanks so much for coming on board. No, Terry, thank you. Kind words. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, so, you know, the thing is, is children's literature today is a sordid affair. It is terrible. It's not high quality, it's uh, lewd, it's crass, it's instilling really bad values. Even the stuff, you know, you go to your children's library in the children's section, um, or you go to the children's uh, literature section at Target or, or Walmart or wherever, and you look at the books on the shelves, and they're terrible. They're absolutely terrible. And they, it's, it's a major problem. And so I'm really excited that we have people like Matt who are stepping over the plate and delivering something that's not just um, a good story with good values and good morals, but it's high quality. And as we as we talk, I want you to show some of the pictures and the illustrations. Yeah, definitely. Um, because we have alternatives often to the mainstream media and what they're pushing on our kids, but it's usually not high quality. And this is something that's very, very different. Um, so um, again, I'm coming at this just from a father. I view this as <laughs> totally important. These things do shape our kids' lives. Um, and their values. But I want to start with asking Matt these questions, because this is not just your first book, this is your second children's book, is that right? That's right. Yeah. So why to you, I want you as the author, why is children's literature so important to you? Well, I mean, one, I'm a father, I have eight of my own kids. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I care a lot about what they see and what helps shape them. But it's also the whole game is the future, right? And shaping the next generation is how you get the kind of society, culture, family, church you want. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's kind of a top priority. And I teach government on Capitol Hill and I teach Aristotle's politics. The beginning and end of that book is education, right? So giving the right kind of education is important uh, for the health of civilization, health of America. That's one. And then, right, you, then you go, okay, well, education. So reading, writing, arithmetic, mathematics. Mm -hmm. Well, fundamentally, one of the principal ways we educate is through stories. What's the narrative as they put it today? Mm -hmm. And that's a big deal. Uh, and so if you have ugly, nasty, crude, or downright disruptive, corruptive, or ill-intentioned narratives being seeded into your art and pop culture for your kids, then guess what's going to garbage in, garbage out. Mm -hmm. You're going to have malformed adults. Mm -hmm. So in order to have happy, healthy, flourishing children, my own, but my neighbors, my my country's countrymen's kids. Mm -hmm. I started doing this with my very well-trained artist and friend, John Fowler. Mm -hmm. Well, so, okay. What were some of, what were some of your favorite children's books growing up? Like, what do you remember reading as a kid that really stuck through with you? Even if it's bad, even if it, you know, it had no. bad roots, like what? I mean, look, so I, I did actually read my, one of my first books was reading a like Dick and Jane, like see Dick run, see Jane ride a hippo at zoo kind of thing, like mm -hmm. just dopey old 1950s stuff. Uh, but then I read Cat in the Hat, which was like kind of zany and crazy and funny. Uh, and I liked that a ton. Uh, I really loved Shel Silverstein's Light in the Attic. Mm -hmm. I read it cover to cover over and over again. I thought that was sort of hilarious and a little subversive and kind of wacky. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I also, I really liked Beatrice Potter Mm -hmm. uh, I really liked Wind in the Willows. Uh, I really liked The Hobbit. Mm -hmm. um, and But I also liked kind of funnier, trashier things like the Choose Your Own Adventure books. I remember those. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. Right? yeah Richard definitely. Scarry was a huge yep. favorite, right? Yep. All the goofball, uh, you know, animal families yep. and Richard Scarry. So things like that. Yep. Bernstein Bears. You know. <laughs> well, I remember, I, you know, I grew up, I cut my teeth on 
you know, more of the zany stuff, like Shel Silverstein. I didn't just read Light in the Attic. I read Where the Sidewalk Yeah, I read that too. All, yeah. I read all of that and, um, you know, The Giving Tree and, um, you know, Roald Dahl, Matilda, all of that. And um, it was up until recently that I realized that all of these books kind of had like subversive themes to them, uh, whether it was uh, anti-parents or anti-authority or, you know, anti-human nature and, and getting kids to more think about um, themselves first and foremost. And so I don't know if you have any thoughts about, like, there, there was like a, t a big turn in children's literature. I, I, I would, I don't know when exactly it was, I would imagine it was in the 50s and 60s, but can you talk a little bit about this turn that children's literature took? Because it was much more classically based. Yeah. Um, and then it kind of got zany and crazy. Well, so kind of in reference to my own book, uh, I, I laughed because everyone was trying to cancel Cat in the Hat from the left recently, right? <laughs> sort of like it's a racist book or whatever, ever. And and leaving all that kind of argument aside, I always laughed because I was like, well, I probably would have canceled him from the right. Because <laughs> uh, I loved it when I was a kid. But that book was lofted up for a particular reason or several, so one which was great. It was simple words to help reading, right? So it was this challenging help reading. But the other reasons that it was lofted up was because it had uh, a single mom and no dad in the picture. Uh, and then it had a little fish in a bowl uh, that was, Dr. Seuss himself said, I wanted a Christian cotton mather. Right, I wanted a, a, a nasty Christian conscience. I'm saying, don't do this when your mother is out. You should not do this. Mm -hmm. And the clever cat with thing one and thing two, the id and the ego, Freudian, let it loose, right? <laughs> Run around the house and break everything and then clean it up with your magic machines, mm -hmm. right? Don't worry, we'll get a vaccine. We'll fix this, <laughs> right? The, that sort of idea was everyone in cultural leadership saw that and said, we're lofting this book to the top. Mm -hmm. We're going to make this book famous. And it is justifiably famous in that like it's fun i like that book mm -hmm. i read it to my own kids i i enjoyed it a ton when i was a kid but it was sort of in one sense i consider it to be a bellwether of the beginning of now we're going to privilege uh fun books that are delightful and a little zany but that aren't just delightful and a little zany in a playful way they're also a little zany in a actual like values way we're mm -hmm. going to start moving people away from traditional family values uh, that America has treasured forever. Mm -hmm. So I see Cat in the Hat as kind of actually like a bittersweet bellwether, uh -huh. you know, and, and like the attic has problems where the wild things are. We yeah. were talking about this. <laughs> you're before and, I know. I love that book myself, but you're like, hmm, maybe sitting in your bedroom dressed as an animal raging and then fictitiously hanging out with a bunch of weird, <laughs> weird burly male monsters on an island isn't exactly the best story for kids. Yeah. I don't know. No, yeah. it's, it's, it's very subversive. Like you yeah. don't, you don't pick up on it. And I think, you know, as Americans and just as human beings in general, we typically just assume the best in everyone. Like we, we, we just, we don't think that someone's competing for the minds and souls of our kids. We just think they're just trying to make money and they're telling funny stories and they seem pretty innocent. And you dig it and there's actually some really bad lessons there. Yeah. Well, and the other one too, like you think of the Bernstein bears, which I grew up with, the dad in that is kind of a clown. Mm -hmm. right like occasionally you see him like working on something like in the shop but oftentimes it's like he's appetitive he's careless he's thoughtless he's selfish he's pursuing some particular desire and it's mom right sort of the marge simpson who's always sort of like here's the morals of the family and i'm going to enforce them and dad's basically a goofball uh -huh. right and that, that just sets lower and lower expectations right and it's gentle and it's funny and Every once in a while, there's almost nothing wrong with like a story mm -hmm. that has a goofball dad. Mm -hmm. But when you have only 5,000 stories with goofball dads, right, right, you start to actually like hurt the family. And it right? starts to serve as an example for how dads act. And then yeah. you start to repeat that and act like that. Right. Um, it's terrible. Yeah, no, it's right. It's <laughs> right. It's imitation. So, okay. That's the bad stuff. I mean, there, we could go down that road, Nickelodeon, Alvin, all, all that stuff. But, uh, you know, I want you to talk about your book. Like how we've talked about the zany, the crazy, the bad values and all that. But what about your book? Tell us, give us a synopsis of your book and just the themes and, and, and why you wrote it. So The Handsome Little Signet is basically uh, a kind of reversal of uh, the ugly duckling story in a way from Hans Christian Andersen. Mm -hmm. That's like discovering who you are, first being confused about who you are, 
but this is actually a story of like, you kind of know who you are because you know your mother and your father and you kind of know what you're about. Mm -hmm. But due to the sort of overstimulation of the world, like just frankly being drowned in media, uh, you get a little confused about who you are. Mm -hmm. And so the story is about a family of swans in Central Park, right? A mom and a dad and their little handsome signet, this little baby swan, right? It's this cute little sweetheart. Yeah, here, uh, keep talking. I'm gonna yeah. show some of, I'm gonna but, show the viewers some of the in illustrations. It, right? The, the, the little signet winds up getting lost and comes across this sort of like clown world display of all sorts of crazy stuff. Yeah, it's kind of like a nod to make way for ducklings in a, in a big way, but instead of Boston, it's Central Park. Well, I, I noticed but, something, oh, go on. You know, but, but just that he, he winds up getting confused and seeing all these wild colors and saying, I just want to be something I'm not. Uh, and, you know, he, he says, uh, after rolling around in a bunch of wet paint that he thought would make him look awesome, he just is a mess. And he says, oh, you know, mother, mother, what shall I do, right? I rolled in some paint that a vandal just drew. I thought I should try to be something I'm not. And now look at the ugly brown stains I have got, right? So he has to kind of get out of this. So it's a little signet who has a fall. Uh, and then, you know, with the help of some little fish, he it's, winds up uh, kind of being restored to health. And I've been using this hashtag uh, on social media called Be What You Are. Be right? What You Are. I love that. Yeah, because he has to learn what he is, a signet, in order to learn who he is. Right. Right. You have, you have to figure that out, your own nature. I, I just, I get the sense that in America, we forget about our human nature, which is something... I don't want to get too highbrow, but that's something that was at the forefront of our founding as a country. The founders knew human nature and our inclination to do bad. And they knew that, you know, we had a certain nature about us that made us who we are and that that could, that didn't really change, but that society was there to change our behavior and activities. And they crafted a whole government around that. And it seems like for the past last century or, or maybe a little bit more, there has been an active movement in this country to make us forget about our human nature and our, our, our fallen nature really, and our inclination to do bad and to make us think that we're all good and that the real problems are society and the, the laws and the, the government and all of that. And you see that effort, once you start to realize that there is a concerted effort and you look at the children's literature that's out there, you see these themes and I can't stop <laughs> see yeah. them and your book helped open my eyes to that and so i just thank you and anyway go on i'm sorry no that, i mean look that the the whole idea of we talk about progress right well there is a real thing such as progress progress towards human flourishing like you do make improvements but i think a lot of times when people today are talking about progress they actually mean it as a weapon against that vision of mm -hmm. the founding fathers a, a vision of basically traditional Western civilization, right? That we have a nature and there's nature's God, right? And there's some, some architecture and that by living according to it, we're going to actually flourish and be happy together mm -hmm. in society. This kind of progress isn't like that where you're trying to reach towards your, the perfection of your nature. This is progress to just see what comes next. Right. Just mutate, just change, just let's just rewrite the rules. Let's constantly move past it. And honestly, you see that argument in the philosophers when you go highbrower, but then part of the reason this book got made is I took a trip to Barnes and Noble ones and just started opening up children's books. I kid you not, I don't even remember the name of this book or the author, but there was one book where the child, wherever the, this girl went, she just morphed into the design of the couch behind her or the sheets or the wallpaper. And she was just, oh my gosh, I'm changeable. And I'm like a chameleon. I just turn into everything. I'm totally plastic. And you'd think that like, oh, she was, you know, this is terrible and she's going to find health and become a little girl again. The end is sort of like way to learn to live with being anything, mm -hmm. right? But if you're anything, you're not something. And if you're not something, you're not someone. And if you're not someone, then you're not loved. You're mm -hmm. not known. You're not known by God, by family, by man, by city, right? That's right. despair. Right. It's like the road to despair, that kind of plasticity. You can do anything and be anything, love anything. Like it doesn't matter. Like, right. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Right. right, like that's terrible. Right? Well, I don't, I don't want to get too theological either, but like, I had a, a a friend who's a priest who I was venting about the whole transgender kid nonsense and and just how horrific that was, and he said to me something that's always stuck. And he said, "What we're dealing with is something very, very old, but also something very, very new. And the old is our desire to be our own god, 
to reject what he's given us, to reject our nature and to, to become our own God and be in charge of everything and make all the decisions. But the new thing is the technology. <laughs> so like Adam and Eve, they could bite the apple, but they couldn't get a sex change. <laughs> you know? right. and so it's, it's yeah. new, but it's old. And you see that playing out all across children's literature. And one thing that's, there's a couple things that, that really bother me about, because there's the, the more in your face, like, and we'll talk about that, like, you know, you go to Target, there's like books about like, just super lewd stuff, like farts and poop and butts and stuff, like really weird, like, yeah. why are we, well, our kids talk enough about that. A why lot are of we kids books that? about butts, which is not okay. It's really weird. Yeah. I mean, um, and I don't, they're immature, right? We shouldn't be in, encouraging immaturity. We should be working that out of them so that when they're 30 years old, they aren't still laughing at farts and butts. Yeah, anyway, uh, but the, 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 the more nefarious stuff, I think, is the sneaky stuff, like the Disney stuff, the Nickelodeon stuff, where like a couple things that come up. Dads are bad and dads are dumb. And you talked about that with the Berenstein Bears. But the other thing is, is like overall parents are treated as ignorant. And they have yeah. to look to their kids junior as knows the way. Best. For, right. Junior knows best. It's Stephen Gray Danis talks about junior knows best. There's all these movies and books where the parents end up finding the truth and reality from their children. Thanks, son, for really reorienting me. <laughs> I don't, I mean, I, I mean, I'm sure I can learn some things from it, my kids. And it happens. And like, if you had a story like that now and again, it'd be great. <laughs> but it's everything. That, that does happen, right? Like right. fathers do set their sons straight sometimes. Right. But the idea exactly that it's every doggone thing, then you get a bunch of narcissistic, you know, little man children who think that they know better than everyone who's older than them and every law, every custom, every tradition that's come before them. Right. It's that, it's that attack that like, I call it bad dad syndrome. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's everywhere. Like you can't, there's, you cannot show a, a strong, careful father today in pop culture. Like it's very hard. And the closest you can come is they're strong in one way, but they still have a lesson to learn. Mm -hmm. Right. So they're, they're strong, but they're inflexible. Mm -hmm. Right. It's always, there's never like a dad who's been like guiding and helping and that the child has to learn to be more like the father, which, right. I mean, not, I'm a Christian, you're a Christian. Like that's the whole goal. That's like the whole show, <laughs> right? Like to be perfect as your heavenly fathers. Like you, that's what you're supposed be to be. Perfect as your heavenly fathers for you're supposed to be like that. We know we, we, that model is refused on a pop cultural level with the discipline of like a Roman army. Like, you know, mm -hmm. that's why I wanted to have this very strong father who sees the problems that his son can get into, gives him warnings, gives him space to make some mistakes, but sort of prepares the way for him to mm -hmm. mature. And then he's got this great line that a swan's heart can wander where a swan can never go, mm -hmm. right? This is like the father knows that like, he's in Central Park, he's in New York City. What is our city today teaching? What's the number one lesson? Mm -hmm. That every love is fine. It doesn't matter what you love. Right. That's exactly false, right? right. Like there are good loves and there are bad loves and there are mediocre loves, right? Right. You can love popcorn, like slow clap for you, mm -hmm. right? Right. But you should love your wife, love your kids, love your country, love your God, right. love justice, love, like love virtue. There's all these things you're supposed to love and you shouldn't love murder, rape, destruction, right? Like right, right. perversity, pornography. There's like, some things you should hate. Like, exactly. And, 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 and that, that idea of training loves, I, I was just, I was hot to trot to have mm. a strong mother and a strong father leading a kid through the troubles. And it's not perfect. The parents even like, there's even a mistake. They mm. kind of let him off to mm -hmm. wander and he does wander, right? Mm -hmm. And he makes his mistake, but that's life, right? It's, yeah. it's nothing's perfect, but. Well, one thing I noticed too, is, you know, you have these shows on Disney and I only know this because I have kids that watch these shows and I picked up on these yeah. themes. And so I'm not, you know, we're not coming at this from a puritanical standpoint. And actually, you said something to me earlier before this that I said, well, is your advice just to shut off the television and never let your kids watch anything? And you said something that really opened my mind. No, talk to the television. Tell yeah. your kids as, as things are stupid or things are dumb or things are foolish or wrong. Talk to the television and tell your kids like, hey, you, you know there's not really a multiverse, right? Like, you know that there really isn't like a million different versions of you, right? Like, this is nuts. This is crazy. Yeah, no, that's right. Sort of, we actually do it at home where we will pause and I'll be like, okay. And, you know, and sometimes like, dad, please, like, I don't <laughs> care. But like, you'll pause for a second and be like, okay, just so we're clear, 
do you see if that's true then this is true mm -hmm. but that's false mm -hmm. right that's not true and that's what the multiverse which is like underpinning the most popular animated cartoon of last year right or two years ago into the spider verse it's under underpins all of the new uh marvel movies and marvel shows mm -hmm. like loki uh it was the the avengers you know uh and doctor strange and all those marvel movies uh it underpins the netflix's voltron mm -hmm. miniseries which is uh, frankly an abomination mm -hmm. that actually has two seasons that pretend to be very good i know to put parents at ease and then by the end, it's like this weird multiverse thing where you're both a man and a woman and a dog and an alien turtle. And so you have no clear identity because the multiverses are like crashing into one another. So mm -hmm. you aren't you, right? But that teaching, like you can enjoy hilarious, like bizarre setups like a multiverse mm -hmm. in a cartoon or in a movie, like that's fine, right? Mm -hmm. Sci-fi, right? but you have to go like, okay, just so we're clear, there's no multiverse, right? <laughs> You're one of a kind, you're made in the image and likeness of God, right? You are very special and absolutely you and not someone else, yeah. right? But if you don't say that, right, what's the implication? Well, and kids wow. will believe anything. Yeah. I mean, they have amazing imagination. I mean, to their benefit and, and but also to their detriment, like they have these incredible imaginations where the multiverse to them when they're little is real. And if no one shakes them out of that, they're always going to think it's real. Right. And it's and it's basically was invented by people who said, huh, the universe sort of is sort of ordered, mm -hmm. but order means that there's some higher power. We can't have that. So it has to be an accidental one off mutation, yeah. which means there's an infinite number of other universes. i.e. it's a myth made by people who wanted to replace religion and mm -hmm. God as a creator and organizer of the to universe. explain everything. So if you have that and that's your like you're at home as a kid, like writing with crayons about the multiverse and no one goes hey son that's garbage right that's a total myth that you right. can, it's a lie about the nature of things right but you can enjoy those things just as we can enjoy zeus right but you can read exactly. dollar's greek myths that's another book i should have mentioned earlier both of my books i actually made them the size of dollar's greek and norse myths because i love those books uh -huh. but we know they're myths right, right. they're called myths, the myths. Yeah. in the sense of like this is garbage but you see, you have to call it out for what it is. Mm -hmm. So really, once the father and mother bring some light of truth, it actually frees you up to enjoy a lot more madcap things. Mm -hmm. Not always. Like sometimes it's just, this is too much. This is too dark. This is too many mm -hmm. uh, bad things, right? And so talking to the TV can actually undermine the family because you're, you're, you're just like talking to yourself like we're just <laughs> too engaged in a bad thing but so i, I and i'm i apologize for my add i think i kind of took us a little bit off oh no that's fine but i think it, it's helpful for conversations sometimes yeah, uh absolutely. so getting back to the the moms and dads thing in these kit these shows like bunked and jesse it's no the one thing that's noticeable is that there are no parents there are no parent parental figures whatsoever involved it's the kids figuring out these big problems by themselves and you look at how sitcoms used to be right you had full house right and that's actually a really wholesome show you the mom was dead but does it sh starts off because the mom dies and the dad needs help raising his three daughters so what happens the family rallies the grandmother comes to live with them the uncles and and his dad the dad's best friend from college they yeah. all come to live together to come together and support each other and when the kids have problems, which they do in every episode, they come together and the parents and the uncles and the authority figures help them work out the problems and teach them. It's totally different with, with media today. There's no parental authorities. There's no family. It's just the kids working together to find out their own problems. And that's in stark contrast to how you wrote your story. The little signet gets in trouble, gets dirty. And the first person he comes to is his mother. And his mother brings him right to the dad and they get him cleaned up and squared away. I just thought it was, it was really beautiful how you put it together. And it stands in such stark contrast to all the forms of media that our kids are just inundated with today. Yeah, I appreciate it. I mean, yeah, at the end of the day, it's just kind of, I, I honestly think there's such a hunger for this kind of thing that like I was joking with you before we uh, started recording. It's like, it's an absolute like, open cesspool, but it's also an open market, right? right? It's like, I think that more people 
uh, who have our beliefs need to make more art. But I also, and this is completely self-serving, and yet I believe it as a like in the justice of my bones, that we actually have to do what 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 I think bad people did for Cat in the Hat. Mm -hmm. We've got to, and you're doing it right now, and I'm very appreciative. Mm -hmm. We've got to put these things out there, and we have to create the culture and say mm -hmm. this is something good. That's something to be elevated. This is something we should all get behind. I think we have to take more responsibility because we were used to farming out our cultural sort of watchdoggery and mm -hmm. and sort of our cultural like you know leaders to people who no longer have our interests in mind right it's, but but th that, that doesn't mean it's going to happen automatically mm -hmm. we have to be conscious about leading the culture mm -hmm. right so creating beautiful art for our kids is just a part of it mm -hmm. i know you're doing lots of other stuff for that but this is incredibly important um the one thing i wanted to kind of talk about that we haven't really is like okay we talked about like the lewd nature of books today yeah. not all of them I just, there are a few beautiful shining just nuggets out there, but even when they're beautiful, they tend to be just neutral. Mm -hmm. And at a certain point, neutral in the face of all this ugliness isn't enough. Right. You know, it's so just, F, just FYI, like every once in a while, you're like, oh, bravo. That's, <laughs> you didn't, you didn't, yeah, you didn't defile my children. Uh, thank you. you know, so, <laughs> well, again, a low bar. It's a really sad state <laughs> yeah. of affairs where we're thanking people it. not for, for not hurting our children. But you know, they talk about hurting our children. There's like, you, you go to the local library, right? And it's on the front shelves, like not hidden away, but they're promoting. It's books on like, how to change your gender and are, are you i am jazz like you know being born in the wrong body having two mommies having two daddies having three dads like what 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 explains this right like so we we talked about how children's literature and entertainment took like a weird turn in the 50s and 60s with shel silverstein and nickelodeon later on um but it's like this is even worse that, you know, Nickelodeon for like how gross it was and like, yeah, you know, it was the, the, the more like subversive form, but this is now in your face. This is now like they're having LGBT pride parades on Blue's Clues, a show for three to four year olds. Yeah. What, it, what, ex, like, do you have any explanation for that? Like, or any theories for how that happened and, and what caused that? I mean, sort of alluding to what I said earlier about like, they really do see the fundamental force of the world as something chaotic mm -hmm. that basically all development is based on random mutation not like the mind of god or creative force logos reason you know mm -hmm. good things right so they do think chaos is actually the road to human flourishing so set cisgender whatever right mm -hmm. complementarity between man and woman that's boring let's mm -hmm. diversify let's mutate let's change mm -hmm. so i think they have beliefs that are based on they've been enslaved to dumb false myths mm -hmm. right that lead them that way but insofar as like we talk about like Bernstein bears like a slightly not very sufficient dad is a far cry from the wackadoo bad stuff that they're poisoning our kids with now mm -hmm. but I, I there's this great line in Genesis where uh, Noah is mad at his son mm -hmm. who was making fun of his father mm -hmm. uh, and he doesn't curse his son he curses the grandson and mm -hmm. says your son to his own son, he says, your son will be a, a servant of servants in your brother's houses. Mm -hmm. That is to say, basically like a slave, mm -hmm. right? Like the lowest of the low in the house, mm -hmm. that he will fall. He will be a miserable person, right? And mm -hmm. not capable of leadership, not capable of self-government, right? Why? It's because when you have bad things, right? It actually takes a few generations for them to truly weaponize and metastasize. Mm -hmm. So I think what we're seeing is sort of the flowering of a kind of pattern of error over multiple artistic generations mm -hmm. that were slight and light and then stronger and heavier. And now they're just toxically mm -hmm. powerful. Uh, and the full effects of the slight deviations from before are being played out now uh, in a pretty awful way. And the, 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 the upside to that, to my mind, is before it was, in a certain sense, sneakier, right? And there's still lots of subtlety and sneakiness going on. But the fact that we're like, hmm, Disney, mm, not sure I trust Disney anymore. Mm -hmm. That conversation wasn't happening in the 60s, or at least no, not nearly. True. Like we're now on edge, like mm -hmm. sort of antenna up, like trying to figure it out, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I got a PhD in literature, so like I'm, I can't not see it, right? I just <laughs> I see the matrix, like look at that, that's a problem. Yeah, oh yeah. Right? But, but 
you know, the, but the good side of this is now that in a certain sense, the sort of mask is off or is, is slipping, you actually see them trying to appropriate your children for those wacky ends. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a little easier to go like, no, sorry, I would like these beautiful things, which like you, I mean, I think your reaction to my book was because there's so much filth and mm -hmm. then you're like, oh, that's really delightful, water in the desert, right. right? I think it's easier to figure out sand from water now because they're not as mixed. There's a lot less good in the garbage that's being made. So you're uh, saying I could, because of the lack of good children's literature, I could become a millionaire being a children's book author. Uh, experience proves otherwise, at least by personal experience, <laughs> but I'll let you know when it happens. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think, I had all these notes on here. Um, what haven't I covered that you want to talk? Oh, by the way, if you have questions, I'm sorry. Um, if you have questions, uh, feel free to send them through. Um, and uh, I forgot to remind people in the beginning, so I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but what, 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 what haven't I asked you that you want to be asked? Well, I mean, about the book, I would say um, the, the, the one thing that I did in the book that was uh, kind of a, an interesting uh, relation to the theme we just discussed, basically the question of identity and human nature, which is, mm -hmm. you know, just everyone's pushing on this, that there isn't one, right? Uh, I set the thing in Central Park for a reason. Mm -hmm. uh, one, after COVID, like New York needs to pick me up, right? Like it just yeah. does uh, after sort of de Blasio, et cetera. But, 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 um, but two, an old teacher of my, of, of, of a predecessor of mine at the school where I taught for 20 years, the uh, high school, um, before I moved over to Hillsdale, um, he, uh, he used to say something, I'm paraphrasing, but he would say, being a male is a question of biology, but being a man is the work of a lifetime, right? Mm -hmm. Or it's a question of art, right? And Central Park, I thought was a great place to have a, a young little signet and his family try to navigate growing up and figure out who you are mm -hmm. because of two parts to that, right? Is mm -hmm. figuring out what you are, hashtag be who you are, or excuse me, be what you are, like figure out your nature, mm -hmm. right? And the nature of you, both like, I'm a boy, I'm an American, I have these talents, not those, right? I have these weaknesses, so I have to be careful, like figure out what you are, but then artfully shaping yourself, mm -hmm. right? Like heightening that nature, like mm -hmm. a rose bush, you add a lattice, mm -hmm. but you don't, you, you wouldn't add a lattice to an oak tree, that would just break the lattice and not help the oak tree, right? The nature of something, you help it with art. Mm -hmm. And that's what a park is, right? It's that is what a, yeah, like that's right. you take the native like ducks and trees and flowers and water, and then you artfully arrange it in a way that respects what they are, mm -hmm. right? And then it leads to human flourishing and living in community. Mm -hmm. So I wanted it set in Central Park because of that central theme, mm -hmm. but also it's just like as a beacon and to have this conversation, mm -hmm. but also just to sort of lead children in a way towards these things and mm -hmm. families that like, hey, you have a nature. And then you're responsible for artfully shaping it. Mm -hmm. That's what you need to be, right? And and we're we're doing the opposite. We're saying, be so artful as to just not give a darn about your nature. Mm -hmm. But that's not art. That's mm -hmm. violence. Right? right. It's gonna hurt you. I, I I what what's most telling to me is I think that the hardest part about doing what you're doing here is is the cur courage that's required to do it in in today's age, right? Like you could sell out, right? You could sell out and, and write stories about, you know, the cheap stuff. I'm sure that those books about butts and farts do very, very well. Um, lots of, you know, immature adults who are still going to Disneyland in their 40s. Diary uh, of a Wimpy Kid. Right, right, right. right. It, but you did it. And, and but, but the easy thing is, it's like our task as Americans, as, as the, the remaining Americans that believe in the, the American experiment. So that, that's what I mean by that. Um, is we just have to tell the truth. We just have to tell the truth of human nature, of God's beauty, of what he created and who we are actually, and have the courage to do that in this day and age. And if we just do it and do it well, like really like work hard at it and, and do a good job like you did here. And again, I just want to reiterate, this is one of the most beautiful books I've ever seen. These, these illustrations are just I, you don't see this quality. I can't, I don't, I don't know if it's close enough, but it is, the quality of this artwork is so good and it's, it's creative and it, it's just, it's absolutely beautiful. Um, 
And so you do it well, you believe in it, you work hard at it, and our job will be fine. We just have to have the courage to do it and to do it well, and the rest will flow. These pe people are hungry. It's like we're in a desert and we haven't had any real nourishment or water, yeah. and we just need to give them the water. It's, it's not hard delivering the water. It's just hard finding it. Yeah, <laughs> so no, that's we've right. got to create the water. Yeah. We've got to tap the wells. Yeah, in terms of speaking the truth, I do think right? There's like multiple modes of how to do that. And when you, when you think of like children's books, I often take uh, Emily Dickinson, our mm -hmm. finest American poetess, right? Mm -hmm. I love her, right? Uh, she has this line in one of her poems, tell all the truth, but tell it slant, success in circuit lies, right? There's a place for standing up and speaking the plain truth to your fellow citizen, mm -hmm. but there's another place, especially for children, right? For leading them to the things that are too complex for them when they're young, mm -hmm. right? But preparing them and leading them in steps towards that, mm -hmm. right? Just the way you would a friend who's got a bad idea. You might not say, you're an idiot, but you might. Maybe that's the right kind of thing and you're really tight, mm -hmm. but maybe it's a work friend that you don't know that well. And so you slowly move them, mm -hmm. right? By like breadcrumbs and bit by bit, and you sort of get them to see, mm -hmm. right? That's what I wanted to do with the handsome little signet, right? Is that prepare kids for the harder truths when they're adults. Mm -hmm. And also, I, I know your audience, I know they're mm -hmm. great people. I wrote this book so you can give it to people who maybe don't share our values and they get a little nudge in the right way mm -hmm. from this book, beautifully, simply, and truthfully, but tell all the truth, but tell it slant, right? It's mm -hmm. in this little story of a signet, it's an allegory, right? It's getting at these things. It presents these images, but not in a judgmental way. It's not part of the polemical fight, mm -hmm. but it starts the process of bringing people back because mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of people who are starving mm -hmm. and don't know they're starving and go mm -hmm. like, I love the desert. I mm -hmm. love the sand. You know, just, yes. They're just eating saltine after saltine, right. right? And then you give them this and you don't say you're wrong about saltines. You say, here's another beautiful saltine, mm -hmm. right? Like, oh, this one's different. It's a granola bar. And <laughs> it's actually right. a little moist. And, you know, that's like, right. it, so that's what I, I, I think part of my mission is we're going to have to win back a lot of lost people. Mm -hmm. And they're not going to take all of our truths right away, one mm -hmm. after another. But art is the way they've been subverting mm -hmm. our fellow citizens for a long time. Mm -hmm. But it's also a good way to help bring people along little by little. Yep. Uh, and that's kind of what I'm trying to do. Well, it's absolutely beautiful. I'm going to do everything I can to promote it. Any last words? No, thank you. I really appreciate this, Terry. Well, I have last words. Go to tanbooks.com. Use a br use the promo co code. Sorry. Yeah, promo code. Use the promo code big family and you will get 10% off. Yeah. No spaces, just big no family. No spaces, just big together. family all together tanbooks.com. Get one for your family. Get one for your kids. Get one for your grandkids. Get one for everyone in your family. It's an incredible book. You won't be disappointed. I'm buying them for my family and I encourage you all to do the same. Matt, thanks so much, yeah, my man. Appreciate it. Yep. Thanks guys.